it's good to talk with you. And you know, these talks sometimes are kind of the universal galactic level that where the, you sort of float in the clouds and look down. Uh, our speaker today is really going to talk to us about problems with the rubber or hits the road. John Cronin is a senior fellow for the Environment, for Environmental Affairs at Pace University's Pace Academy of Applied Environmental Studies. Um, and managing faculty in the Pace Environmental Policy Clinic. I don't know if you're familiar with the Pace program, but they've played a, 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 an unusual and a key role in merging uh, law and public policy and get and producing students who both are knowledgeable and ready to go out there and uh, try to actually grapple with it, get their hands dirty. Uh, along with uh, Pace professors uh, Nick Robinson, Dick Ottinger, uh, former congressman Dick Ottinger, and uh, Robert R. Kennedy Jr., John founded the Environmental Law Clinic in Pace in 1985. He's had an immensely varied career. <coughs> I've been lucky enough to know him for the last 30 years or so. He's been a uh, environmental activist, a legislative aide in the New York State Legislature, which these days may not be something you want to post about that much, John. Um, a commercial fisherman on the Hudson River, so he knows what he's speaking about. And the country's first river keeper. You may know that there's a large and vital network of river keepers and sound keepers around the country who are the first line of defense of some of our most precious waters. And John was not only the model, but with his uh, colleagues help instigate the spreading of the river people models. I first met John in 1982 when he was chief, when I was chief scientist of the Environmental Defense Fund and was getting involved in the acid rain issue with uh, partly instigated by John's co-conspirator Robert Boyle. Uh, the Hudson River has been a hotbed of environmental activism uh, since the 1960s at least. Uh, dating largely to the uh, fight against Con Ed's plan to build a pump storage facility on Small King Mountain. Uh, John worked with Boyle, Kennedy, and others, and uh, he really, they helped turn a, a series of what would appear to people to be local battles into really an entirely new national approach to advocacy that drew its energy from unifying the concerns of local working people and local people who had a lot of resources, by the way, in the Hudson Valley, and getting those people together to form a kind of unified coalition to fight for the river and the other natural resources of the beautiful Hudson Valley. Um, it was a, <laughs> there was this core group of really highly energized and rank, rambunctious advocates, and John provided a lot of the bridge the high energy stuff and actually focusing on specific strategies to get things done. So I'm very happy to have him here. He's going to talk about imagination, inflation, environmentalism, and the myth of clean water. John? Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, happy anniversary. 2015 is the 30th anniversary of the Clean Water Act's goal to eliminate the discharge of pollutants into the nation's waters. So we haven't had a chance to celebrate that this time this year. Take out a few moments to celebrate that extraordinary achievement. This is our count up. It's been 11,234 days, 12 hours, 9 minutes, and 31 seconds, 32, 33, since the 1985 goal to eliminate the discharge of pollutants, which we've gotten nowhere close to. And we're going to talk about that. How many people here were born after 1985? Don't be afraid to keep your hand down. You were born into a world, into a nation that should have been free of pollution. Uh, I want you to remember that. All the rest of you, same thing. You, you're living in an era that should be free of pollution. We're going to talk a little bit about why that did not happen, how far away we are from that, and, um, and why it's such a big secret. Um, I want to start out, uh, particularly for this, the students here, to talk about my career or you know, how I got here a little bit. 
because the, the big lesson of my career is that every stage of it was accidental. And uh, uh, I mean accidental in, 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 the, in the best kind of way. Uh, if, if I have one skill, I have a skill for keeping my ears and eyes open for opportunity. Uh, I will tell you that every step of my career, every job change I've had, and I've had many, uh, I worked for the Clearwater Organization, I worked for Cena Cutson, I worked for Congressman Hamilton Fish, I worked for Assemblyman Maurice Hinchy, I worked as a commercial fisherman, I was a business agent for a commercial fisheries association, I was the Hudson River Keeper for 17 years, and for some bizarre reason, I'm on the faculty of Case University now, uh, and I will tell you that at every stage of that career, uh, I was told that there were no jobs out there. All right. So, um, uh, you know, fortune will favor you if you take that as an instruction that everybody else is believing it, but you don't. Right. And use that to your advantage. There's one piece of advice I can give you about, about a career based on my own experience. I was born in Yonkers, New York. And um, there were two things that, uh, that people of my generation understood about the Hudson River in Yonkers, New York. One was that the good Lord created it to separate New York and New Jersey. All right? I mean, this, is, this was the big function of the river. Matter of fact, the, 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 one of the best things we could do when I was a kid was go up to this place called the Ridge in Yonkers where you could look out over the Hudson. And to me, the most amazing thing about the Hudson River was I could see another state. That everything on the other side of the river was New Jersey. And for those of you who are old enough, the other thing that we knew about the Hudson River was that the beautiful palisades uh, on the other shore were named for an amusement park that sat on top of them. Uh, but the third thing we knew about the Hudson River was that uh, we were supposed to stay away from it. We said, they said it was dirty. Nobody used the word polluted back then. Uh, this is the 19, I was born in 1950. Nobody used the word polluted back then. Uh, it was dirty. It was a dirty river. We're supposed to stay away from it. And, and, and in my generation, dirty water meant something very specific. It meant polio. Uh, anybody who went to the, public, to the private or public schools in, in the city of Yonkers knew a kid with braces. Uh, and so water was something we actually grew up fearful of uh, in, uh, in the, the city of Yonkers, New York. And I was not alone. Most kids my age felt the same way. I, I, I ended up living in a small house not far from the park. But later on, when we moved out of the apartments we, were, we lived in, and uh, that park had a stream. And we'd go down to the park, and we'd run through the stream, and then we'd come home and grab the hose to wash the polio off our legs. And that, that is literally how we, we thought of water uh, growing up. Uh, so, and my, own, my, my interests were very simple. I was interested in um, baseball, I was interested in cars, and I was interested in girls. Um, and that was cars, baseballs, and girls. Cars, girls, baseball, and girls, cars, baseball. Uh, this was my young life. I had absolutely zero interest in this dirty river that was right, in this, right next door to where I lived. Very different than the generations before me, though. With my parents, with their, their great idea of, uh, of a date was to go rowing on the Hudson. My father learned how to swim on the Hudson. My grandfather was a fisherman on the Hudson. Most of this I didn't know about until, I, until later on in life. And, uh, but I was the part of that first generation that grew up separate and apart from the river. And it never occurred to me it would be any different. And because it never occurred to me it would be any different, the Hudson River just never occurred to me. I, I, just, I never thought about it. It was a chance meeting later on in life with uh, folk singer Pete Seeger which started a Hudson River organization that got me interested in volunteering. Uh, in school, I had been a, a peace activist and very involved in politics. Uh, and when I met Pete, he talked me into volunteering for the Clearwater organization. And I was lucky enough to volunteer for a project where I, I collected the evidence of, that led to the first prosecution of a polluter uh, under the new Federal Clean Water Act in 1972. Uh, the Tuck Tape Company. Uh, Tuck Industries had a big tape company on Fishkill Creek, which emptied into the Hudson River and it had a permit for two discharges. And uh, we went out and to simply count them. We found one, two, three, four, five, six. The, the six one was coming out of a second story window, seven, eight, nine. We found 26 discharges. And um, uh, everything you can think of. And back then I was pretty ignorant. I'm still waiting for the <coughs> 
uh, there were chemicals, uh, hot chemicals coming out of pipes, sewage. There was a place where they had dumped waste adhesive out the back of the back doors on, into Fishville Creek. Um, but this was typical. This is the way it was in the 1970s uh, and into the 1980s. Anywhere you went, any industry you visited, you found the cast-offs, the discharges, the waste, the dumps uh, of that industry. Uh, so bad was it that the Diamond Candle Company across the, across the river into Windsor, New York, had the worst situation, believe it or not. It's nothing more recyclable than wax, but in the back of their building, there was wax everywhere. There was wax in the trees. There was wax on the ground. There was wax in Quesaya Creek. But this was typical. This is what, what people did. And it went on like this for, for a long, long time. You, when I worked in the New York State Assembly, um, I worked on, um, uh, I was part of a special investigative staff uh, looking at US Army involvement in Love Canal. And I, I investigated the Manhattan Project. And I found evidence that the Manhattan Project had been dumping, uh, not in Love Canal, but up in the Niagara Frontier. And uh, I found, it was down in the, the Defense Department going through their archives, and there was this grand diagram of this building called Lindy, uh, Lindy Products. And they did some uranium uh, enrichment. And I followed the path of their production. And at the end of the buildings, there was two double lines that said two Lindy Wells. I actually found out, found the project engineer, which was difficult. And I said, what is this diagram? And he said, oh, well, you know, we just pumped the uranium oxide wastes down into an old abandoned drinking water well. Uh, that's just what we did back then. Uh, and this is what we inherited in the 1970s, and to a great extent we still continue to inherit today, uh, is that's what waterways were for. Uh, I'm probably telling you a piece of history you already know, but I can also tell you as a first-hand witness to it that um, it, by 21st century standards, it was extraordinary. It was nothing you could imagine. Uh, wrecked cars, raw sewage. The commercial fishermen at Tappan Zee Bridge could tell what, what color the, the uh, General Motors plant was painting cars and trucks that day by looking at the color of their nets. Uh, it, this, this was the Hudson River, and it had a national reputation for it. We thought we were the only ones, and we found out much later that we were like every other industrialized river in the United States. Uh, and a movement, Michael referred to it, a movement built in the Hudson River that was way before its time. It started in the mid-1960s, before the first Earth Day, where a group of people, Pete Seeger was one of them, Bob Boyle, who Michael mentioned was another, who decided the river could be something very different. Uh, but here's what, we, what you don't know, which is not so obvious. Back then, if you decided that the Hudson River shouldn't be polluted, if you became a champion for Peter Hudson, you were a communist. You were a troublemaker. You were an agitator. You were a political plant from somebody. Uh, you were anything but somebody who was trying to help your community. And it was not looked upon favorably. So the people who built this movement on Hudson River were incredibly courageous. Uh, they were attacked in, in ads in the New York Times. They were attacked regularly uh, in newspapers. Editorials said that they cared more about fish than people. You had to be pretty brave in the mid-1960s to be one of this group of people. Uh, it was not an easy time. It was not fun. You lost friends. Your families got mad at you. It was, environmental issues were not the issues that they are today. And I'll say one other thing about that and move on. Uh, and I won't come back to it unless you want to ask me about it. It is a level of courage that environmentalists do not have now. They do not have now. To stand up and say, the Hudson River should not be polluted, industry should clean up, lose friends and family, be editorialized against in newspapers. Environmentalists, hardly any environmentalists experience that today. It was a different breed of people with a different idea. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a level of courage that we need to see more of. Uh, they didn't have the support of universities. They didn't have the support of multi-million dollar organizations. They had none of that. And I'm proud to say 
that I got a chance to work with those people. I stand on their shoulders. I was not one of those brave few. Um, but it's one of the things that makes the, the Hudson River so important to the modern environmental movement. So I came to it uh, quite accidentally. And then when I, uh, I volunteered for this Pipe Watch project, I got very interested in the Clean Water Act. And uh, I decided one day, I found a copy of it in the Clearwater office, and I decided to read it. I actually read the Clean Water Act from front to back. And I didn't understand a lot of it, because it was all a new vocabulary to me. But I understood very well the beginning of the law. And let me tell you what the law says. The law says that its objective is to um, maintain the, phys the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. And to do that, here's what, here are the goals it's set out. One is this, it is the national goal that the discharge of pollutants into the navigable waters be eliminated by 1985. That's 30 years ago. To achieve that 1985 goal, the first step was, it is the national goal that wherever attainable, an interim goal of water quality which provides for the protection and propagation of fish, shellfish, and wildlife, and provides for recreation in and on the water, be achieved by July 1st, 1983. <coughs> waters that are safe for fish, waters that are safe for fishing, waters that are fish safe for swimming, waters that are safe for paddling, which is redundant with swimming. If you're a paddler, you're going to swim. Uh, I'm a paddler, I swim. And I'll, I take all the water. That was supposed to be achieved by July 1st, 1983. Uh, environmental law professors, some like to say that that was a, an aspirational goal that was not required. And it was not required, it was a goal. But I don't call something as specific as July 1st, 1983 aspirational. And if you read the legislative history, or a terrific book, if you really want to get into the weeds about the Clean Water Act and environmental history, wonderful piece of environmental history called <coughs> Unlikely Environmentalists. It's a fabulous book. Uh, and um, you'll see the history of this law and the thinking that went into it. They meant it when they said July 1st, 1983. They meant it when they said 1985. They thought that this was achievable. And this is, a, this is the heart of the law. Uh, if you study law, don't let anybody tell you anything different. Third is the national policy that the discharge of toxic pollutants and toxic amounts be prohibited. That's not a goal. That was supposed to be and a requirement of the law. Toxic substances and toxic amounts prohibited. It is a national policy that programs for the control of non-point sources. Does, does everybody know what a non-point source is? Most people are nodding their head. Right. It's not coming out of a pipe. It's, it's coming out of the watershed, off the ground, parking lots, roads, and so on. People often say, I'll, I'll finish reading it. People often say that this is not the most important part of the law, and the 1983 goal is not the most important part of the law because so much pollutant, pollution comes from non-point sources. But listen carefully to the language of the paragraph. It is the national policy that programs for control of non-point sources of pollution be developed and implemented in an expeditious manner so as to enable the goals of this act to be met through the control of both point and non-point sources of pollution. In other words, they gave non-point source the exact same immediacy they gave 1985 and 1983, that those were not achievable without this, and that the major purpose of the law, the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's wars, could not be achieved without it either. This was the heart, there, there are a lot of other policy goals. Uh, this, was the, this was the heart of the law. So, um, so what happened? So, let's see here. Oh no, actually, before I get to that. I'll go back to that. So, here's what happened. I'm gonna read to you some statements from the federal government. Since those goals passed. Carol Brown, EPA Administrator, April 20th, 1994. 
11 years after the 1983 goal of fishable swimming waters. Today, EPA is releasing a report that shows that 40% of our nation's waters, lakes and streams, are polluted. Many are threatened. Many more are threatened with pollution. Christy Todd Whitman, EPA Administrator, March 27, 2001. Despite past progress in reducing water pollution, almost 40% of the nation's waters assessed by states still do not meet water quality goals established under the Clean Water Act. 2009, EPA's National Rivers and Streams Assessment. 55% of the nation's river and stream miles do not support healthy populations of aquatic life. Lisa Jackson, President Obama's first EPA Administrator, January 12th, 2010. America's water bodies are imperiled as never before. It's a statement from an internal memo from her to EPA staff very soon after she was appointed. Gina McCarthy, current EPA Administrator, September 9th, 2013. This is the worst one of all. Progress in advancing clean water and safe drinking water goals in the United States is stalled. Where is it stalled at? It's stalled, it's stalled at America's water bodies are imperiled as never before, which was just a continuation of the 2009 finding that 55% of the nation's waters are in unacceptable condition. That is still where we stand today. So what are the facts? Why are they saying these things? This is where it gets depressing, kids. More than 200,000 facilities still have legal permits to discharge industrial and municipal pollutants. That's from the New York Times investigation. It's more like 250,000 facilities. Approximately 17.7 million lake acres and 1.3 million river miles were the subject of fish consumption health advisories in 2010. That, is, that has gone up since 2010, representing 42% of the nation's total lake acreage and 36% of the nation's total river miles. This doesn't include all state advisory. This is a finding that is frozen in time. It was that way 10 years before, it's that way now. 41,509 water bodies in the United States are designated as impaired, with more than 25% of those due to pathogen contamination. 19 and a half million Americans are made ill annually by drinking water contaminated with bacteria, viruses, and parasites. I called up the chief researcher on the river, her name now, at the University of Arizona. I talked to her about it, and she said the number was gone up. Mercury was detected in all fish sampled from 291 streams across the United States, from the United States uh, Geological Survey. 40% of the nation's coastal beaches experienced at least one closure due to pollution in 2012. It's the last day we have reliable numbers for, causing a loss of more than 20,000 beach days. I want to take a moment to say something about this. That number has gone up. Coastal beaches. What the EPA means by coastal beaches are beaches that are immediately on the coast of the United States. It does not include tidal water beaches on the Hudson River. It does not include Chesapeake Bay. It does not include um, any any water in the internal United States, uh, when um, Iowa's beach state, when a bunch of Iowa state beaches were closed down because of algae this summer, those advisories did not get registered with EPA because EPA only looks at coastal waters. This is not even a remotely accurate number. Uh, I, I, I run a blog called EarthDesk, uh, EarthDesk.org. I did an investigation last summer of, of beaches that were closed in states that are not on the coast. The stories are, are, are hair-raising, uh, including one death down south from kidney disease. Uh, these do not come up in the EPA's estimates of uh, beach closings. Because the law that created their beach closing program um, specifically excluded non-coastal waters and specifically excluded inland tidal waters. <clears throat> Sanitary sewer overflows of raw, partially treated sewage from municipal facilities occur in almost every municipal system in the nation totally approximately 40,000 incidents a year. Again, uh, a, number, a number that doesn't change. Um, so, this is, 
obviously very distressing. And uh, it's distressing for a bunch of reasons. All right? So we didn't reach the 1985 goal. The law was written in 1972. What are the odds that in 13 years we we're going to clean up all the water pollution in the United States? Does anybody think that was remotely possible? Okay, no, nobody thinks that was remotely possible. So, so what's the problem then? What's the problem? The problem is the number one national goal for water pollution is to end the discharge of pollutants 30 years ago. 30 years ago. The goal has not been changed. Our number one water policy goal is to stop pollutants back in 1985. This is the core. Our number one policy goal is to, our number two policy goal is to make, make water fishable and swimmable 32 years ago. That's still our goal today, is to make water fishable and swimmable 32 years ago. This is the core of the law. This is the core of our national water policy, water program. This is the core of what drives the EPA and the states that it has delegated authority to, to clean up the nation's water. So does anybody think is any longer the goal to eliminate the discharge of pollutants? I mean, I've got an attitude about this. If you haven't changed the date, all right. To me, this is the library card policy. If you've got a library book sitting on your desk that was due 30 years ago, when's it due? Now. Now. It's due now. You owe 30 years of fees, but it's due now. Right? So if 1985 is still our goal, and we're not going to do it now. We don't have a goal anymore. It's gone. Did somebody have their hand over here? Was it a realistic goal when it was set or was it just arbitrary? It was an unrealistic goal by a group of people who thought they knew what they were doing. Um, we, back in the, the Clean Water Act started being written in 1971. Ed Muskie, um, Senator Henry Jackson, um, uh, Howard Baker, Tennessee uh, senators who were behind the law um, argued long and hard about what was possible, what wasn't possible, and they thought these dates were, were, were realistic. And when 1985 rolled around, the first thing Congress should have done is revisit the date and create the day. If you're in business, or if you're managing a nonprofit, or you're on an assembly committee, and you've got a date goal ahead of you, and you decide to Ignore it for three decades? Well, your job ended a long time before that. But this is what we've got. So I thought to myself, all right, we've got a great progressive president now. And a really an EPA that's energized like they haven't been before. So what are they saying? So I, I've written about this a lot on the Earth Desk blog. So a PBS reporter had the opportunity to ask EPA, Gina, EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy what she thought about my observations. So let me see here. Is, is the sound up? It should be up, right? Wait, can you hear that? Is that too low? What's that? Oh. You're not trying to sound check? Well, it's, 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 well.
That's all we got. Oh, I really want you to hear this. It's one of my favorite things to the computer. Favorite things in the world. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a Windows guy, so I don't know where the volume is here. They usually do. There's usually a volume component. I don't see it. Never had the volume. All right, I'll try. I'll try. It's, it's not going to be on for very long, so try to squeal me for a second.
what the administration's policy is about this stuff. So I thought somebody else said this first. I should point out, by the way, uh, that we're not just acting on climate change, we're also doing more for conservation. Since I took office, we've established 10 new national parks, 10 new national wildlife refuges, this is the League of Conservation 11 new national monuments. <laughs> I just announced plans to further protect our oceans. Our oceans. And, and, and I'm not just going to stand with environmentalists, I'm going to stand with sportsmen and conservationists against members of Congress who want to dismantle the Clean Water Act. We got to dredge up that old tape of uh, the Cuyahoga River, River on fire, the Chicago River, and just remind people. We got to dredge up the old tape about the Cuyahoga River fire and remind people. I would love to sit down with his speechwriters. There is no tape of the Cuyahoga River fire, for starters. And this is where Gina McCarthy got her talking point from. The way to defend the failures of the Clean Water Act is to dredge up, to use the president's word, the Cuyahoga River fire. Anybody here know what the, what the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire was? Down in New York City, Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Full of immigrant laborers, fire broke out, doors were chained, a lot of people died. Notorious in labor history. Notorious. You know the story. So imagine I'm sitting in front of a labor group and talking about labor rights. And I said, we gotta dredge up that old story about the shirt triangle shirtwaist factory fire. Show people what we're talking about. Can you imagine telling that to working people? You're not going to burn in your factories anymore, so shut up. This is what we're being told. This is what we're being told. What makes this even more remarkable, however, is what a bad telling of history this is. The Cuyahoga River fire, and this is a story that's repeated over and over and over again, had nothing in the world to do with the Clean Water Act. Nothing. You know what it did? You know what incident there was that President Nixon, congressmen and senators stumbled over each other to be next to and say it will never happen again and pledge there would be a national water law? <coughs> the Santa Barbara oil spill of 1969. Why doesn't the president use the Santa Barbara oil spill as the example? What do you think? Spill that yeah, we keep on having huge spills. We just had another Santa Barbara oil spill a little over a month ago. He's not going to bring up the real reason. This is bad. This is not bad because it's inaccurate. It's bad because of what the American people have come to believe. They've come to believe a law is working that's not working. They've come to believe that some obscure fire that's been built up in, in environmental mythology was the cause for the most aggressive environmental law on the planet when it was written. And we should be happy that the rivers outside our door are not catching on fire. Is there any doubt that the public would be complacent about a law like the Clean Water Act when this is what they're hearing? They're hearing it from the president, for God's sakes. And he gets applause for it from an audience that should, if anyone should know better, the League of Conservation. Voters should know better. May so, may yeah, yeah, go, please. Anybody who wants to pop in and ask a question, just ask. Does it sense to make our water effluent uh, laws too stringent? That some companies will be forced to shut down and lay off people. Yes, we did. When 
countries that are pouring all the pouring on the cost of pollutants into the water. Well, it's not the same planet. Yeah, I'll, I'll, it's a very good question, and I'm going to get to that, because it's, it's an important question, because it goes to the heart of what the Clean Water Act was actually supposed to be. Um, So I'll, I'll, I will come back to that, I promise. So what do environmental groups say? Um, the National Wildlife Federation on the 40th anniversary of the Clean Water Act told its 4 million members that, um, where's the quote now? The land, this landmark act, this is the National Wildlife Federation, which has 4 million members, that's one of the biggest mailing lists of environmental groups. This is what the, what the National Wildlife Federation said about the Clean Water Act on its 40th anniversary um, in 2012. This landmark act has ensured and will continue to ensure that America's waters are fishable, swimmable, and drinkable. It has guaranteed that, and it will continue to guarantee that. Fishable, swimmable, and drinkable. This is patently untrue. It's characteristic of what environmental groups say about the law. And the reasons are very simple. And I'm going to stop in a moment because I want you to ask questions, and I'll add some more information on answering questions. The, the reason is very simple. Environmental organizations are fearful of opening the debate about the Clean Water Act in Washington, D.C. because conservative forces might roll it back. Might get rid of the law altogether. What do we need a law that's not successful? Why do we need a law that's not successful? So we've got an ethical dilemma pitted against a political dilemma. The ethical dilemma is, are we going to come clean about the Clean Water Act? It's not the Cleaner Water Act, it's the Clean Water Act. Are we going to come clean about the Clean Water Act, or are we going to take the political route and make everybody feel good about it, not point out its fatal flaws, the fact that it has no destination, it's a ship without a rudder, that has no navigation chart in stormy waters. This is what the Clean Water Act is. Right? I spend a lot of time on boats. This is what the law feels like when I, when I hold it in my hand. What do we do? For you, for those of you who want to be policy makers, who are studying policy, there may not be any more profound, you might not hear it talked about a lot, there may not be any more profound in environmental debate or question about environmental policy than what you would do about this ethical dilemma versus this political dilemma. So I want to say more, but I want to see if anybody has questions. You don't have to ask questions, you tell me I'm wrong. Have you seen some success with the Clean Air Act with Metro Boogie Pines and Air Pollution? I mean, so is it really popular? Why exactly it was no problem? Sure. Yeah, and, and, and Michael and I talked about this earlier. There's a lot of other deficiencies in the Clean Water Act, and here's one central deficiency in the Clean Water Act it has no public health goals driving it. It has no public health goals driving it. There's no, there, matter of fact, we do not have a federal law that has public health goals driving the water law. We have the Safe Drinking Water Act, which is about the delivery of water into people's homes. We've got the Clean Water Act, which is about everything but public health. Because the, the architects of the law thought, by massive investment in sewage treatment plant construction, they were going to take care of the public health problems. They didn't envision emerging, emerging contaminants like uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, or synthetic musks. They didn't imagine uh, trillions of microbeads uh, getting sucked into, uh, into drinking water intakes and into fish. Uh, they didn't envision treatment plants that couldn't treat for anything. They thought the public health issues were going to take care of with sewage treatment plant construction. Uh, so there are no public health goals in the Clean Water Act. And with 40% of the nation's waters either too polluted for, for, for human contact or fish, the idea that there's no public health goals to correct that is, is an extraordinary deficiency. And we need a new law. I mean, it's what we really need, which is 
not what you're supposed to say. Yeah. So this uh, conundrum of not wanting to open up the law is the same problem for the Endangered Species Act, the same problem for the Clean Air Act that was more successful. So mm -hmm. the balance is different. Well, you know, this uh, political situation could last for, I mean, who knows? Right. Uh, what do we do in the meantime? I, what we do in the meantime is we just tell the truth. I, mean, I, I just don't think there's a substitute for telling the truth. Uh, if, we, if we didn't tell the truth, if, if, we, if, we if we didn't tell the truth, the climate issue would not be an issue. All right? I mean, we're, we're, we're telling the truth in space. We're not just telling the truth. We're going beyond the truth <laughs> in some of the things we say about climate. And without fear, that's going to result in the gutting of the Clean Air Act because the Clean Air Act is not passed. So is there an equivalent to what Obama, the Obama administration has done on the climate issue, namely just by uh, executive uh, authority, push it as far as he could, and start the wheels moving on change? Can that, there's no equal, no such opportunity in the clean water President Obama. Or what about at the state level? I mean, yeah. you know, well, well, so, okay. Give us some I, I, I am going to give you some hope. Yeah, I, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was waiting for a question that says, why should we get off in the morning? All right, so. That was it. <coughs> Two things. The first thing about Obama, Obama promised amendments to the Clean Water Act, and they never proposed any. Uh, the second thing that happened is the Supreme Court uh, issued a ruling that said headwaters where it should not be considered navigable waters under the Clean Water Act, um, that the Clean Water Act was not meant to cover headwaters, uh, farm ponds, the head of streams, and so on. Um, because navigable waters are part of interstate commerce, which gives the Congress the constitutional authority. And so the executive order that Obama did issue, or the EPA regulation that was issued, I should say, uh, was to address that issue. Um, sadly, the League of Conservation Voters, among others, put out video ads and, and print ads saying that that one narrow clean water rule was the one that was going to save your drinking water, ignoring everything else about the law. Here is what we have to do. The Clean Water Act, as I just said, it's a federal law. It's basically a navigation law. Uh, there's some authority that the federal government has. Uh, it has exclusive authority over navigation, and it has authority over interstate commerce. Uh, and so the, the, the Clean Water Act falls under the, the, this commerce navigation unique authority the federal government, government has. Um, the Congress can't do things without constitutional authority. So they passed the Federal Clean Water Act. Under the Federal Clean Water Act, they can delegate to the states the authority to carry out that law. But here's something the states can do. The states can have more rigorous requirements than the Clean Water Act has. The federal government cannot prevent the states from having requirements that are more rigorous than the federal law. The only real solution, and I'm, I'm promoting this in New York State, I probably have a better chance of getting a hearing from my governor than you, than you might from yours if you're, you're here, if he's ever here, uh, is that there should be a New York State Clean Water Act. There should be a New Jersey Clean Water Act. Now, if I were the governor, what would I do in this Clean Water Act? Well, I wouldn't repeat a lot of the stuff that's in the federal law. That's already there. But I'll tell you what I would focus on. I'll tell you what I would focus on. And even if I didn't write a new law, what I would do is I would call a group together of the best business people, the best innovators, the best policy wonks, and I'd say to them, I'm charging you to come back to me with a plan. I want a new date for the elimination of the discharge of pollutants. I want a new date for waters that are fishable and swimmable. I want to know the innovations that are necessary to significantly upgrade treatment, industrial municipal treatment in New York State. I want to know the technology necessary I want to know the businesses that have to be created to make that technology, make those innovations. And I want New York State to be the global center of water innovation in service to the rest of the United States, in service to the rest of the world. Because this is not a unique problem. This is not a unique problem at all. 
And one of the things that has not happened under the Clean Water Act is innovation. It's innovation. Now, yeah, go ahead. I'm, so this is related to this innovation question. How much is innovation needed versus is a lot of the issues that we're seeing with the Clean Water Act an issue of compliance and lack of enforcement by the EPA? The EPA could have 100% enforcement tomorrow, 100% compliance tomorrow, and none of the data I showed you would change. I can guarantee you that. None of the data I showed you would change. Nothing. It would not have a significant difference. This is not an enforcement problem. So, would you so, 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 so that, follow because up on I, that, though. Just just, to understand. It, who here thinks that the best way to stop pollution is at its source? All right? You know, usually when I ask this question, I bring a bag of corks. Because you're the source. You're the source. What, what are you going to do differently? You know, a trillion gallons of sewage go into the nation's waters, and everything in our medicine cabinet, and the microplastics we scrub our body with, the roof, the, 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 the loft industries in our towns, all go through those sewage treatment plants. So we, what's the sources we're going we're to stop here? The, the fishing and swimming has as much to do with, with the massive amounts of, of, of waste we're putting out of, of, of our treatment plants and, this, and the, 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 the combined sewer overflows. Uh, we're not going to end farms. They need best management practices. So what we, and cows are not going to stop shitting any more than humans are going to stop shitting. So yes, we have to control sources, but if we think controlling sources and enforcement and compliance orders are going to solve it, they aren't going to solve it. And the majority of sewage treatment plants in the United States are the same secondary treatment plants that were built in the 1970s, in 1970s. The exact same ones. So I think innovation is key. But where? You may or may not agree, but I think this is true in the climate, in the climate arena as well. Environmentalists are very slow at catching up with the concept that innovation is important, and the marketplace is the delivery center for innovation, and that if we can convince industries they can make money off of it, then we're going to have progress we haven't had before. And I know you're shaking your head. Significantly, that's great. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, but just some side, just to, to flavor. Yeah. You did mention there's going to be a, about the 1975 fire on the Charles River. No, I know all about the fire on the Charles River. In any case, uh, you've lumped together uh, a wide variety of pollutant sources. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, and every one of them that you named is important. But each of them is individually controllable mm -hmm. and can be attacked piecemeal mm -hmm. and should be. So you were talking at the beginning about uh, effluent streams coming out beyond permit numbers, beyond amounts, and those can and should be enforced rigorously and retroactively, as we all know, for example, the GE issue with regard to the Hudson River. Okay, well, hold, let, me just, let me hold you right there, because I just want to correct one little thing you said. That 200,000 figure are legal discharges. They're not illegal, they're legal. And GE's permit is legal. Yes. Okay. So is rocket dies and well, many, yeah, many others. But it was not, it's not wasn't in the first yeah. Okay. But you, so let's go back and start from the beginning. Mm -hmm. The first thing you've got to do is eliminate the grandfather exception. Because this is a vehicle for claiming that if we weren't regulated when we started, we have no reason to be regulated today. Mm -hmm. This is a, a lifeblood issue of the business community. Okay? That's got to be crippled. Second, uh, and, and we do it all the time. When you bring your car in for uh, inspection, that it left the dealership fine is not a reason you're going to get it allowed on the streets. Right. So we have precedent. Mm -hmm. Second, you talk about farmers, but in fact, the way that the agricultural industry operates, which gives little enough information, is that it potentiates excess use of pesticides and fertilizers. And antibiotics. Yes, indeed. All of those can and should be controlled. Um, and the same goes for all of the uh, pollutant sites. It's, it's a matter of introducing a closed system mentality as part and parcel of the way you do business, with no exception and no uh, easy allowance for, oh my goodness, God, jobs are going to be lost, economic costs of this, that, and the other. And I know that's the vehicle for conservative policy. 
each of those has to be dismantled first. You destroy the underpinnings, the building falls. All right, so let me, t let me take those in reverse order, okay? Um, closed system, no argument. How does that happen? That's a regulatory requirement that you are responsible for your crap. In the same sense, you pick up after your dog, and if you know right. in England, right now in London, there are cameras photographing you with tickets in the same way sure. that you sure. easy pass. So, so ha ha what, what is the vehicle for all of a sudden these big open sources turning into closed systems? What has to happen? You need a series of regulations with severe penalties, and you need to breach the corporate veil. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the goal of those? What are the goal of those regulations? Uh, the goal is right now to reduce pollutants to acceptable EPA standards. But the goal of those, and the goal of those regulations are to make the actors innovate. Yeah. So you know, no matter no matter what you do. You come back to innovation, and, and, and you know, I, because I, I, I believe me, I've looked at the hog farms, I've looked at the KFOs, I, I studied this issue very well. And whether you're talking about closed systems or you're talking about direct industrial discharges or sewage, and I'll tell you what, if somebody came up to me and said, Mr. Cronin, you're the administrator of the EPA, I've got $100 million for you, are you going to spend it on enforcement or are you going to spend it on rewards for innovation? I would take the ladder in a heartbeat. I wouldn't even think about it for a second, number one. Number two, the grandfather, there's no grandfather in the Clean Water Act. The way the Clean Water Act works is that, this way theoretically it was supposed to work, is that you get your permit, it tells you what you can discharge and what amounts, how often you have to stamp. Um, theoretically, in five years, that permit gets stricter. It's called the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, and it means exactly what it said. It's a national system for eliminating the discharge of pollutants. Eliminate it. So every five years, your permit gets stricter. They stopped upgrading the permits, and they stopped upgrading the permits for a simple reason, because we've run out of innovations. They have no technology that they can put in the permit. They've got no, they have no, there's no sewage treatment grant money to, to, to upgrade sewage treatment plants. Uh, meanwhile, you know, I, I know we've got to run, but I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you an example of this, okay? Three years last ago, point. last point, and now I got to, oh, he's got to go, you got to go. Uh, three years ago, I was invited to a, a, a mini conference at General Electric. It was called From Used to Useful. It was about the recycling of water. I, sat, I was the only environmentalist there. I sat in a room with 100 engineers from all over the world talking about how the only solution to our growing drinking water problem is to recycle wastewater. I spoke for in the policy segment, and I raised my hand and I said, we've got a tremendous opportunity here for transfer of technology. If everybody in this room is committed to innovations that are going to make, take turning wastewater into drinking water economical, technologically feasible, phys feasible, GE spent like a billion dollars on that. You can also use this to achieve the elimination of the discharge of pollutants. And as soon as I said that, Everybody in the room groaned. And I said, what are you groaning about? And one of the engineers, I think it was from Texas, raised his hands and said, if you're talking about the Clean Water Act, it's a punitive law. It has nothing at all to do with innovation. It's a losing argument here to think that we're going to transfer that technology by cooperating with the EPA and the Clean Water Act. Whether or not he was right or wrong, there's something very, very wrong with the fact that he thinks so. That, that, anyway, so first of all, let's thank John. Yeah, I'd like right? yeah, anybody who wants to continue the discussion to jump in the chat with him. I will point out that this tension between regulation and innovation is present throughout all of environmental uh, laws, and, it, and the balance has been struck more effectively under the Clean Air Act. Yeah. And it gets part of the structural problems you're saying. And where are, the two, where are the two places innovation happens? Whether it's policy or technology, two places. Industry and universities. So you're in one of the places. So go out and fix it. Thank you. Thank you.